Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Clergy. I'm Pastor Doug Chinberg. I'm Pastor Scott Pitch. We're glad to have you with us once more as we continue our series on prayer, uh, where the disciples ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, and that's what we ask as well as we enter into this, uh, I think this is the fifth week, right? Fifth out of, of six. Our, of yes. our prayer ser- series, and we've got one more to go. So after that, we'll be back on our Gospel of Luke study, so we hope you can come back for that as we conclude our study on that uh, wonderful Gospel from, from Luke. Um, we have a couple of uh, pointers to, or things to point out here. Uh, if it's your first time with us, we want to thank you for being with us. Uh, s- let you know that we we do this live on Wednesday mornings at, at 10, uh, but we also record it. So if you can't catch it live, you can always watch it later on YouTube or Facebook, or you can catch it on podcast form wherever you get your podcasts from. Usually we release those on Thursday. So. Yes. Um, but yeah, if you if you are new with us, we want to welcome you. If you're an old old timer who's been with us the whole time, we appreciate your uh, your sticking with us and uh, and uh, your participation is always welcome as well. So if you have any questions for us, go ahead and include those in the comments section or shoot us an email. Uh, we love to respond to people who have comments or questions. So. Uh, well, perhaps we should begin today with a prayer. Should okay. we go before the Lord in prayer as we talk about prayer? That seems fitting. So. I'll, I'll, I'll open this with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and for the new day that we have that you have given us and the opportunities in that day that we have to serve you and to love our neighbor. Today, Lord, as we come before you and think about um, temptation and the challenges that we have uh, in this life and your promise to deliver us from that temptation, we pray, O oh God, that you would simply... Uh, Bring us to an honest and open discourse about our own shortcomings and help us to turn to you as our source of strength in this world where our weaknesses are often exploited. We pray, God, that Jesus would be our example as we read about how he resisted temptation. And simply, God, we pray that this day you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us, that your word may enliven us, that it might uh, encourage us, that it might uh, propel us forward to do your will. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so we find ourselves in a world that is filled with pain and loss and hardship, and that's something that all of us suffers and goes through, and and um, whether it's a loss of a dream or a job or a loved one, uh, we've all had those experiences, and all we have to do is turn on the TV again, and we watch the news, and we see that we're, we live in a broken world uh, we see the war that's going on around us and, and the hardship that other people face. Um, uh, David in Psalm 51 said, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And we're reminded that uh, this sinfulness affects us as the devil tempts us, uh, as the world tempts us, or sometimes it's our own sinful nature that mm-hmm. causes us to question God or to fall away or or tempts us into sin. And... Um, and while the devil wants to destroy us, uh, we also know that God is at work to preserve draw us, us. Mm-hmm. preserve us, draw us close to him, give us a strong faith, um, causing us to look at him. And these are both, these concepts are, are reflected in both the sixth and seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. So that might yeah. be a good place to, sure. to begin by reading those. Yeah, and, I'll start with the sixth petition here. <clears throat> and lead us not into temptation. Uh, Once again, this is from Luther's small catechism. Uh, What does this mean? That's his question uh, that he asks all the time, and in in it we find the answer that God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature might not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. And the seventh petition, but deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation, and finally, when our last hope, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this veil of tears to Himself in heaven. Yeah. And so maybe one question to begin with is simply, how do people drift away from the Christian faith? Uh, there's all kinds of answers. Yep. Well, there's a, yeah, there's the answer of like a, a massive event in their life, and then there's a thousand little pinpricks. Yeah. Or there's just 
never interacted with it. There's a lot yeah. of people who never have heard the name of Christ, and therefore they don't even have to fall away from him. They just yeah. never knew him. Yeah, but oftentimes it, people experience a, a loss or a hardship or a difficulty, and mm-hmm. it causes them to question uh, if God is good and if God is loving. Yeah. And and sometimes those, those pains that uh, come into people's lives uh, cause people to begin to doubt God, to fall away, to look to other things that might give them hope or strength. Mm-hmm. And, and they end up depending upon those things rather than God. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the number one question that you hear uh, people who doubt in the existence of God asking is like, how could a good God allow evil to exist in the world? Mm-hmm. And it's on the surface, uh, uh, I think in their minds, it's a fair argument. Mm-hmm. But I ask the question is like, okay, but that doesn't solve anything. You know, that doesn't, what, what is saying, how does saying that there is a good God and somehow evil exists in the world and there is no God and therefore evil exists in the world, there's still evil in the world. Yeah. There's still hardship and death and pain and sickness. So you haven't solved your problem at all yeah. by saying, how could a good God allow this to happen? And if there is no God, there is, there is nothing but there is no itself. hope <laughs> yeah. at all. Uh, to be delivered from that, you're right. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, just on its surface, that that kind of logic, it's like I, I see where you're going with it, but so what? That doesn't that doesn't help anybody or do anything other than callously become nihilistic and brutal and mean, yeah. uh, which doesn't help anything. Just makes it way worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's interesting, not only do we face evil and hardship and suffering, but we also see that Jesus himself faced hardship and suffering and challenges. In fact, there was a time when Satan confronted our Lord at the beginning of his ministry and tempted him in a very real way, and Jesus overcame that temptation. And, and, and let's go ahead and read uh, that passage from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 4, the first 11 verses. Um, And this is where we find Jesus being tempted by Satan. Um, Matthew 4, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. And um, so here we find a a time in Jesus's life when he came face to face with Satan and temptation. And so, first of all, maybe we ought to look at what were the temptations that uh, Satan was using to to tempt our Lord. Yeah, they were temptations not uncommon to the rest of humanity. It's that the devil is really good and really proficient and really practiced at tempting people. And he just ramps it up for Jesus because he knows... If he can get Jesus in his human flesh to be tempted, then the rest of us are doomed. So he starts off with bread um, and says, you're hungry. Yeah. Just eat. You know? Yeah, it'll be a simple fix. Just yep. change these things. Mm-hmm. And then the second one is is power, right? I have all the power in this earth. Worship me and I'll give it to you. So he tempts people with power. He tempts people with the you know, fleshly desires of our heart with bread and other, other vices and um, he tempts people with power, certainly. And then the last one is tr- through trust, right? He tempts people through placing, getting them to place a false trust in, in a higher power other than, than the one true God who, in the word that he has to say to us. So he tries to convince Jesus that, you know, he can trust in the Lord's angels because they, the, because he quotes a, misquotes a old, old Testament Bible verse, um, saying, you know, you can, 
throw yourself off and yeah, you know, you'll, be, you'll okay. be fine. Uh, you know, put your trust in those angels. And it's like, well, God says something slightly different. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he, bread, power, and trust. Those are the three kind of central t- ways that that he tempts people and that he tempts Jesus here, I think. Yeah, I think in another gospel lesson it said, and the devil left him until an opportune time. Yeah. And so it wasn't the last temptation that Jesus faced. Nor the first, probably, right? Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Have, we experience a lot of temptations as a kid, right? Yeah. The cookie jar and the, you know, being mean to other kids and, and those kinds of things. And so I doubt it was his first temptation, nor was it his, his last. last. Yeah. And so as, as Jesus deals with Satan, um, he does one thing, mm-hmm. and he continually looks to or goes back to God's Word yep. to put Satan in his place yep. and to give clarity to the situation. And interestingly, it's not just God's Word, but it's the proper application of God's Word, because even Satan is bringing God's Word into the picture. That's true. Um, and so, and he did that in the garden too, right? Before Adam and Eve, he said, he didn't yeah. surely say that, you know, he said this and yeah. kind of hints at being an advocate for God's word when in reality he's twisting God's words to his own devices. Yeah. And how often we do that, how easy it is to do that, to, uh, look at our own context and, and, uh, think we have the answer, whether we quote scripture uh, yep. verbatim or, uh, we think we've got the the, the idea in our own mind. Yep. And um, um, so very easy thing to do to be tempted and sometimes a challenging thing to do to, um, one, to know God's word, to understand God's word, and to apply it correctly. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And uh, so all of those are important. Um, uh, there's another scripture passage uh, in James, mm-hmm. James chapter 1. Uh, verses 13 and 14. Sure, it's a pretty and, short one. So Yeah, I'll... and so what is, we'll talk about what James says here about temptation, but let's go ahead and read it first. Yeah. James 1, 13 to 14. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted uh, by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged by their own evil desire and enticed. Okay. So, first of all, just a simple question. What's uh, James saying here about temptation? Uh, its source is not with God. It's within okay. our own sinful nature. Okay. It's really what Luther says. It's, the, it's in the uh, petition. It's the, um, the world, our sinful nature, and the devil. Those three are the source of, of temptation. Okay. And um, so the... Those are all the cause of temptation, and um, it's interesting that, that James also talks about our, how easy it is to sway our desires, mm-hmm. um, how easy our desires can do things that are selfish, self-centered, uh, that focus on, just on us, and um, we think it's, um, that's just what we need to do is take care of ourselves, and, and um we don't recognize that as God gives us his word, we are to love ourselves, but we're to love our neighbors in the same way that we love ourselves. Mm-hmm. And we're to put God uh, above all things yep. uh, as we live our life in this world. Including yeah. ourselves. Including ourselves, Which absolutely. Hard. Yeah. And uh, there's another passage in the New Testament, uh, something that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, that also talks about this, and and I'll, I'll read that one too because the last one was so short. Okay, so. <laughs> First Corinthians ten six to thirteen. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, or, as some of them did, and in one day twenty three thousand of them died. We should not test Christ, and some of them, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
Okay, so first of all, what does Paul say about temptation? He gives us some examples here from the Old Testament when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, Mm -hmm. and we see that time and time again they fell into sin. Yep, as we are wont to do as well. Yeah, just as we do. And I I think one of the things that he's saying is uh, simply how easy and natural it is that we fall into sin. Uh, It doesn't take uh, much thought. It doesn't take uh, much effort. Um, our desires can pull us that way naturally, uh-huh. and we can turn away from God. We can turn inward towards ourselves, um, and sin just can happen without hardly even thinking about this it. This is why I, whenever people kind of contend with the, the moral claim that man is basically good or man is basically evil, I always look at it this way, that the kind of gravitational pull of the heart is towards wickedness and evil. Yeah. We, we can do good things, but it's actually counter to our nature at the heart of us to do things which are selfless and do things which are honoring of God and morally good. Um, we're only able to do those things because we're empowered by a divine force to do so. It's not our nature yeah. uh, to do those things. Our nature is to be the, be the toddler who goes, mine, 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 mm-hmm. and doesn't share and pushes others and cries when they don't get their way. That's that's really yeah. what yeah. our, like Natural I said, the self. gravitational pull of our heart is towards those yeah. sinful, evil desires. Yeah, there's some philosophies that also say that we have a neutral um, uh, position, neither good nor bad, uh, but it's what we're taught. And but I you know I've uh, you brought up children I've I've never seen parents teach their children to do evil wicked things or selfish things mm-hmm. but children do those things naturally and you hardly ever see children naturally do altruistic things yeah. uh, those must be taught and instructed and practiced so that kind of yeah. shows you that the neutral thing is not exactly true yeah. And it's, it's also nice that uh, Paul goes on to talk about that when we are tempted, um, God provides a way out. Uh, it yep. provides a, a path where we can get through, we can endure it, he says. And um, uh, again, it's with his help, with the power of his word and his spirit that are at work in our lives, um, uh, that guide and lead and empower us uh, to do what God would have us to do. Yeah. And even then... We, we sometimes struggle with it. We sometimes have selfish motives, even when we do the right thing. Yep. Yeah. One, one of the ways God best helps equip us to overcome our temptations is through fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, being kind of accountability people, people right? Yeah. If you struggle with a type of temptation, maybe it's some kind of immorality of the flesh, or it's some kind of predisposition towards anger and rage, or it's selfishness, or whatever you're kind of pet temptation is having someone there who who you trust and who who you've invested in to say help me with this and who is a christian themselves and knows that struggling with temptation is not a sign of of uh wickedness or evil it's just who we are as people then that can really help you to overcome a lot better than trying to go it alone. I think Absolutely. a lot of times people feel like with their temptations they have to have to face the battle one on with with Satan one on one, and you will lose that battle ninety nine times out of a hundred. Yeah. But if you first of all, first and foremostly trust in the Lord, that that makes it a pretty fair fight, and it makes it a, an unfair fight to your advantage if you incorporate other brothers and sisters in Christ to help you as well. Yeah, and that's one of the great blessings of marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, when a husband and wife are both, uh, they both have a strong Christian faith, they encourage each other. Uh, it's one of the things I, my wife Kathy and I talk about sometimes, that uh, we make each other better. Mm-hmm. And when, when that happens in a marriage relationship, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But it, it spills over not just into the marriage, but also into the family, yep. that when parents teach and train their children how to live a mm-hmm. God-pleasing life, um, that that will stay with them throughout their life. Mm-hmm. And while they can turn away, um, uh, there's those, those roots in which they were trained and, and taught, uh, those have sunk deep in their life and, and become a powerful um, uh, strength, godly strength, uh, in the midst of facing temptations. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the, I think marriage is certainly a good one, but I think one of the greatest, um, 
successes or victories that Satan's had in this current modern age is the idea of the the lone wolf male who doesn't need friends, doesn't need confidants, doesn't need accountability partners and people to challenge them to grow. There's so many men in America these days across all generations who just go it alone. And it's kind of a pick yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality. Or if you have buddies, they're football and drinking buddies, not life growth, like challenge kind of people or, or scripture study kind of people. Uh, and so I think that's really been one of his greatest successes is convincing men in this culture that having friends is a sign of some kind of weakness or lack of masculinity or, or whatever. Yeah. And it's just false. Maybe we should put in a little advertisement. Pastor Scott's going to be leading a men's yeah. retreat here hey. in, in June. In June, June the 4th on yeah. Saturday, yeah. And what's the theme for that? It's going to be portrayals of masculinity in media, where we okay. look at sort of the, the tropes that, that movies and TV and, and our culture at large have kind of put on what a man is, is or is supposed to be versus what God says a yeah. man is supposed to be. And so we're going to gather as a group of men and, and talk about that and see how we can encourage one yeah. another and build yeah. each other up. Definitely. So, yeah, that's, I didn't even intend that to be a commercial, but, yeah, come on down for yeah. that. Yeah. And um, so um, so what hope does God give us in the, in the face of temptation? Uh, we're, we've talked about it a little bit. Um, here in this text, um, it tells us that God is faithful. Uh, he is faithful to us. Um, that tells us that God is for me. Yep. Uh, he's not against me. He wants us to uh, to be godly people. He mm-hmm. wants us to be close to him. He wants us to do his will and to follow him. And um, so it reminds us that, that God is on our side. Um, it reminds us that God is, is with us. And um, again, we, we don't go in this world alone as a Christian. Uh, God stands by our side and yeah, he's given us that promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And the ultimate expression of God with us, Emmanuel, is Jesus in the flesh, yeah. right? And so the ultimate expression of God with us is not just God's got your back spiritually, but God took on your flesh to endure the same temptations that you're going through right now. That and you're not experiencing anything that he didn't experience and yeah. overcome himself. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the only things that really truly gives hope and comfort in the midst of a season of intense temptation is to say, like, when Jesus calls you to resist that temptation, he's not doing so up on a cloud somewhere from a vacuum saying, look at you, how weak you are. You can't even overcome this temptation. He's saying, I know it's hard because I experienced it too, but yeah. you can do it. And that yeah. really is helpful. Yeah, there's passages in Scripture that that talk about that Christ is at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us in yeah. the midst of the temptations and hardships and trials that we go through. Um, we're also reminded that in our baptism— We've been connected to Christ, to his death and to his resurrection. Mm. And uh, because of that connection, we have a, uh, a new identity. We've been born again. And uh, God has placed this person of faith inside of us uh, to help us fight against those temptations. Yeah. And to step out of this for a minute, the connection point of of when we when we experience that temptation and how we in some sense, interact with God in the midst of that temptation is prayer. And that's why we're talking about this right now. And that's why Jesus included this in his prayer to his Father and to our Father, is to say, like, I know there will be seasons where you're you're sitting in the, the kind of burn of your own temptation, not knowing what to do or where to go. Go to the Lord with it. Pray, pray about it. And I... I will hear you for sure, and yeah. I will speak to you. And sometimes har- the one of the hardest things I've recognized in my life is simply then not only to commit this situation to the Lord of when I find myself in temptation, uh, but then to wait on Him, mm-hmm. um, because Paul goes on to talk about that that God will provide a way of escape. Yep. And I don't know, I'm sure other people, our listeners, probably have found themselves at a time when it seems like any decision that they make is going to be a bad decision. And that's when, that for me, that's one of those times where I spend, try to spend more time in prayer mm-hmm. and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm going to need you to work out a solution that will solve this issue. Yeah. And um, it's been interesting and, and, and kind of fun and exciting to look back and see how God has worked in, in, uh, 
in my life or in, in other people's lives. And as they have waited on him, he's worked a situation out where everything just kind of fell into place. Mm-hmm. And it's it, then it becomes one of those times where we simply thank the Lord for being the God that he is and, and doing the work that he does and um, uh, bringing the protection or the relief that, uh, that we pray for. And that's a, a clarity that only comes... In that, in the aftermath, in the in the hindsight, right? Yeah. That you don't have when you're in the middle of that temptation is that uh, God saw you through it, but you don't see it when you're when He's pulling you through. You only see it once you're through it. Yeah, and that's challenging because you want to see it now. Yes, but you won't yeah. until much later. Yeah, um, maybe another distinction that we should make is what is the difference between temptation and testing? Yeah. The Bible talks about both of those. That's so, a great question. So that is that is sort of one of those uh, questions that shows how God is involved in this process. When it, whenever James says that God will not tempt, it's like, okay, well, why is there temptation then for us? And this sort of idea between temptation and testing is where it, where it's at. Because I heard it. I heard it this way. I read a. I read a little kind of metaphor that that was sort of like this. That scientists did a a study on um, on trees, and they set up this kind of like fifty foot biosphere thing to to do it in a controlled environment. And they were growing these trees, and the trees kept falling over, and they couldn't understand why they were healthy. Otherwise, they couldn't understand the root systems looked pretty good. And they finally came to realize that the reason the trees were falling over is because they had never experienced the wind before to strengthen their, you know, resolve so that they can resist the wind and learn how to hold themselves up. And so the trees kept falling over. That's kind of what God does in our temptation, right, is he allows us to endure kind of the storms and the winds of life and to go through some of the hardships and testing and temptation uh, so that we will grow in our resolve to overcome them and that we will learn to trust in him more, and thereby not be like a tree that just falls over at the slightest sign of any kind of, um, you know, testing or, or challenge. Yeah, so. and as I, I think about those two words, I, I always think that that Satan is the one who tempts us, mm-hmm. and he always tempts us to fall away from God, or to uh, live a self-centered life, or to do something, and as we do something for ourselves, oftentimes it can either hurt ourselves or other people. And so uh, it brings pain into our life. Uh, so temptation is always to cause us to turn away from God, where testing, as you mentioned, is always there to strengthen our faith yeah. uh, and to keep us actually closer to God. Definitely. Yeah. And so we look to him, cling to him, talk to him, pray to him. Uh, all of those things help strengthen that root system in our faith life yep. um, that keeps us strong in the faith mm-hmm. and, um, and what a blessing it is. So um, there's a, a little story here. Um, back in 1890, the U.S. Cavalry confronted uh, and attempted to disarm a band of more than 300 Indians, Sioux Indians, in the Battle of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. The Indians believed that their ritual clothing, they had on these special shirts, they called them ghost shirts. They believed that those ghost shirts would protect them from the soldiers' bullets. But when the shooting stopped, there were 25 cavalry, cavalry men who had died, but more than 150 Indians, men, women, and children who had died, and others who were wounded. And so their ghost shirts had not protected them. And so as we look at um, the belief of what these Indians had in their ghost shirts, um, how is that different from the faith that we have in Christ? Uh, that's a great question, I guess, but uh, the sort of difference that I see primarily is the um, God doesn't ever promise you to stop. He's going to stop bullets, but what he does promise you, he fulfills. So the things he, he promises are are everyday provisions, which we see him mm-hmm. providing. Um, relationships that are lifelong, which we see he sustains. And then things we haven't seen yet, like eternal life and things which we don't have a tangible evidence for, like forgiveness of sins and and sanctification, you know, and the growing of the faith. And uh, we don't see the, we see the signs of those things, that, like a, a wind blowing in the Holy Spirit, you know, th- kind of idea. But we don't see the actual tangible 
gift of it. Um, and so we know we can trust in the stuff we can't see and in the stuff we don't see yet because we see him continually fulfill the promises that we do see, even though they're mundane and boring and we, th- we hardly forget to remember that the clothing on our back is a gift from God, the food in our stomach is a gift from God, the air in our lungs is a gift from God. Mm-hmm. So if he provides these good gifts and promises others, like we should probably believe in those um, gifts. And so our trust and our faith in God is not, it's not, it's, it's not, not really blind faith, right? People yeah. talk about having blind faith. It's not really blind faith. It's simply extrapolated faith, where we we have trust and confidence in God providing for the things we see Him provide every day. And so, because of those things, and because of His Word, and because of what Christ has done, we extend that basic, small seedling of faith out to the the promises that he has that have not yet been fulfilled yeah so this uh this ghost shirt that the indians wore was kind of a good luck charm yeah a kind of a rabbit's foot uh um we hear people today with um with different kinds of good luck charms that they uh, like to carry around with them we um we see it in in uh, or hear about it in in uh uh uh, people that play sports, uh, they'll put on their shoes and socks and uniform in a certain way every time they go out to play a game. Or um, uh, we hear it with uh, sometimes people car- carry medallions or um, um, special coins or something in their pocket or place them in their car and, mm-hmm. and say, these are going to be our good luck charms and take care of us. And yeah. and uh, it's it's one thing if if, you know, if the coin reminds us to look to Christ it's another thing if we think that our our luck and good fortune is found, you know, just by carrying this coin mm-hmm. or rabbit's foot that we have. Yeah, um, it's kind of like the the ghost shirts will protect you from bullets, or a tank would protect you from bullets, right? That the idea none of us have probably ever been in a tank before, right? Have you ever been in a tank? No, I don't think anyone probably listening has ever been in a tank. But if you got in a tank and someone aimed a gun at the tank and pulled the trigger. Do you feel pretty convinced that that tank is going to stop that bullet? Yeah, because it's done it a thousand times. It may not have done it for you, but it's going to do it for you. You feel confident yeah. in it. Now, go shirt, like, when has a shirt ever stopped a bullet before? Yeah. You know, unless it's a Kevlar vest. I mean, yeah. but but uh, a go shirt never has done that. And so putting your confidence and trust in something that's superstitious or far-fetched is one thing, but putting your confidence in something where you're just extrapolating belief in that thing based on what it already has proven to do. That's sort of what our faith in God is, is like we put our trust and our faith in him for all things because of the things that we know that he does do for us. Yeah. And it, it just reminds us the way that we put our faith in things. It's, uh, we've talked about before how we are, um, as human beings, we are God makers. We, we put our faith in so many different things in the world. Yeah. And, um, there's the one true God that says, I want you to trust in me and mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take care of you. Yeah. And, um, uh, and he does indeed watch over us. Um, so, um, um, there's another passage that we can read from Daniel, Daniel chapter three, that that uh, talks about some of God's people placing their trust in uh, in God during a, a difficult moment in their life, and um, I'll read that from Daniel three verses sixteen through eighteen. It says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, the king, and said, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So this is a Old Testament story when... King Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue and asked everyone to bow down and, and worship the statue of him. And anyone that would not would be thrown into a blazing, fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, didn't bow down. And, um, and so they uh, expressed their faith. Some people thought foolishly, um, but um, it's interesting um, that these men... You know, it's it's different from the ghost shirts because they place themselves not just in something of this world, but they place themselves in God's hand. Mm-hmm. 
And um, along with that, they believe that God could protect them if he wanted them to, but they said even if he doesn't, um, you know, we'll give up our lives because we know it's wrong to bow down and, and worship this false god. Yeah. And, um, and so there are, there are opportunities all around us that uh, cause us to look away from God or to trust in other things, and um, uh, how wonderful to see the resolve that they have to say, you know, even if something harmful happens to me, I'm mm-hmm. not going to turn away from the true and living God. Yeah. The thing that this drew me to was sort of the idea of worldviews that we have con- mm-hmm. that are conflicting nowadays, where there's the the biblical worldview, and then there's the other worldviews that are not biblical. And we can list off several of them, but just let's just do an, uh, the the mental exercise of this worldview versus others. If if you know people come and challenge the worldview that you have, the answer should sound somewhat similar to the answer that that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave is that that uh, our God will will show this to be true mm-hmm. because he's promised it all along, that it, that it is true. And his, his signs have shown and his son has shown that it is true, and that's why we have faith. And even if things in this world seem to suggest otherwise, uh, and God may allow that to happen to so that we are... Um, strengthened in our faith through testing, uh, but we know that he'll prevail, pre- will prevail in the end. Um, I think that's a good, that, that's what that kind of drew me to, is like the faith to step into a f- fiery furnace in the face of a king rather than bowing down to their their gods or their worldview even, is so, uh, hopefully the kind of faith that God's people have um, to say, I disagree with your premise on truth, I believe that the truth is what we find in God's Word. Yeah, so. and my my faith is going to be there whether God allows me to die or not. Mm-hmm. My my ultimate life is in His hands. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> so kind of a personal question that we can ask our listeners is, what is the greatest area of temptation in your life? Mm-hmm. Very personal question. Yep. What's the temptation in your life? As I... Um, asked myself this question, I guess what came to mind were the seven deadly sins. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I wrote those down. And so the seven deadly sins include pride and greed. They include wrath or anger. They include envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. And, you know, I looked at that list and I thought, you know, I've, I've been tempted by all of those things. Mm-hmm. I've fallen in temptation because of all of those things. Yep. And, uh, um, and so, you know, as you think about your own life, what are the temptations that you face? And, and, and then how do you deal with them? Um, how does God want you to deal with them? And how can we answer that question? Oh, man. Uh, prayer. Okay. I think that's the, the, the means by which God has provided to us to assist us in helping overcome our temptation. When Jesus was tempted... Um, he overcame through God's word when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's probably tempted to say, you know, maybe let's try something else other than this whole crucifixion thing. He went to the Lord in prayer. And I think that's really where we find ourselves in those moments where we're tested and tried and tempted is to say, uh, I'm, I'm beyond my capacity to handle this Lord. Uh, I need you to help me handle it. Yeah. Um, we read that that passage from uh, um, what was it? If you, uh, First Corinthians uh, earlier. Um, it's it's an often misquoted part of the Bible where people will say things like, "God will never allow you to be um, tested beyond your ability," uh, or basically it comes out this way: "Is God will never give you anything you can't handle." And the reality of the situation is it's that's not true. God allows situations in this life to move us beyond our capacity to handle so that we become dependent, dependent upon, upon him. him. Yeah. That's what he ultimately desires is for us to through faith turn to him. Not out of desperation like that's not what we're we're trying he's trying to do to us is to lead us to a point of despair where we'll find him. He may allow that to happen if that's the only place where he may be found is in your mm-hmm. despair. 
that's how much he loves you is he'll allow you to despair so that you might find him and have eternal life. But that's usually not how he operates. Usually he allows you to get to a point where you're flummoxed and then you come to God and it's like, ah, I see now. Okay. That's what you wanted me to do all along was turn to you in, in prayer. And so that's our encouragement is we may experience things which are, are so hard we don't feel like we can handle them. And that's where we are called to turn to God in prayer. Yeah. So prayer is, is one way that will help us overcome temptation. I, I think of what Jesus did um, when he was tempted by Satan. He uh, went to Scripture, mm-hmm. and he had that Scripture hidden in his heart. And that's uh, an encouragement, I think, for people to um, memorize Scripture today. Uh, it's it's not a discipline that, that people often do. Um, and sometimes there are even, I, I think, there are kids' songs that just are, are scripture put to music, mm-hmm. um, but it's a great way to hide that word of God in your heart and, um, and then pull it out when it's needed. And so we can, we can pray to God, we can either read or hear scripture or sing scripture. Um, and a third thing is something that you mentioned earlier is that um, um, through the help of Christian friends, mm-hmm. they can help us as well when we gather around uh, those whom we know and trust and, and uh, those who are mature in the faith, um, and they will encourage and support us in the midst of the temptations we find ourselves in. And <clears throat> the tried and true method is a combination of the three, right? Yeah. That we yeah. do all of them and do them often. Yeah. Uh, and I think they build on each other sort of to some degree. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why um, we encourage people to, to come to church uh, because they hear God's word. They, there are times of prayer. We encourage that. Um, there are times that it's also a place where we're gathered with other Christian friends and uh, relationships can be built. Yep. Um, it's why we have our small group ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, those same things happen in our small groups, and, and it becomes a very powerful um, weapon against Satan and the temptations that he throws our way. Yep. And uh, there is one more passage we want to look at, um, and that is Ephesians chapter 6. It's, it's one uh, where God encourages us to be strong in him. And um, so let's go ahead and read that from Ephesians 6. All right. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, is, it, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand, on, stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the, peop- all the Lord's people. Yeah. Um, you know, as we, we talk about Scripture, there's a, <clears throat> a phrase that, that I read, I guess, as a kid growing up, and um, uh, people used to encourage me uh, as I would read God's Word that, they, that we would read it, mark it, learn it, and digest it. And, uh, and in a sense, that, that taking it to heart. Um, and that was just a good image for me, I guess, as I was growing up, that God's Word is more, is more than just to be listened to. Uh, it's to be taken to heart. It's to be taken apart and looked at and, and, and trusted in and uh, chewed on and thought about. That's what the word meditation means, yep. uh, to go over and over something in your mind. Well, think about it scientifically. When you digest food, what happens to yeah, food? It, it becomes breaks apart and goes into your system. It becomes a part of you, right? Yeah, and so yeah. that's what God's Word does. When you digest His Word, when you ruminate on it so long that it just kind of dissolves into your bones and it becomes a part yeah. of you, it becomes your natural response to how you talk to people about God and how you talk to people about your life and what life is all about, what the meaning of everything is. It just becomes a part of your identity, part of who you are. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's, I think, what is pleasing to God when, when we read his word, is that it just becomes as natural to us as the songs we learned when we were little kids. You know, they, yeah. they just stick in us and they become part of us. Yeah. And so here he mentions uh, different pieces of armor, and he encourages us to uh, to put on those pieces of armor. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of interesting as we look at the different pieces. Um, we've got the belt of truth. Why is that important? Well, the the belt on a on a soldier's uh, tunic or whatever would have been the thing that essentially transformed him from like everyday robes that he was wearing to like fitted and ready for battle so the truth Mm. is uh, is sort of the way that equips you to actually be like prepared and ready Mm -hmm. for the thing that's going on around you uh and so that if you're if you are without the belt of truth you're not like girded up and ready to go you're kind of easy pickings for whatever comes along so you have to dedicate yourself to the truth so that you're ready and prepared to to for whatever comes yeah so then he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Why is that important? What's the the what's the, the importance the, of the breastplate? The breastplate protects the vitals. Okay, all right. Vital so, organs. Um, yeah, it's a solid piece of bronze that was worn over the chest and the abdomen, uh, and the groin area too, because there's all kinds of vital um, veins and and arteries there too. So a strike in any of those areas by an arrow or a sword would immediately kill the soldier. And so. The breastplate of righteousness is sort of a thing that protects the vitals of your spiritual life. If you are, if you have, if you're dedicated to truth, and yet you're living an unrighteous life, it means that essentially you you might pay homage to the truth, but you don't actually live it out. And so it's easy to strike at you and leave a a, a devastating mark that that's mortal, you know, a mortal wound, and uh, spiritually speaking, of course. And so wearing righteousness means putting to practice the things that are true. Okay. Um, and I think that's what it means to wear the breastplate, ble- yeah. breastplate of righteousness. Yeah. yeah. And is it is it our righteousness that protects us? No, no it's it's the, it's God's righteousness okay. put upon us. Um, and, and when we're talking about righteousness, it, it, that's sort of an interesting uh, tie-in to, to Abraham and what Peter uh, says and Jesus say about Abraham, that his faith was what was credited to him as righteousness. So yeah. it's our faith in God, actually, that then protects us, which is interesting because later on we learn that faith is the shield, too. So we kind of get double protection from our from our faith in God. Yeah. Uh, it talks about our feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel. Okay. Uh, why is that important? Well, this is sort of an indication, I think, to the idea of how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news, right? Yeah. So the, the word gospel itself... Uh, comes uh, from good news. So it it invokes this idea of a messenger sent by someone of authority to another person of authority to deliver a message. And so uh, it naturally has this tendency to to be a person wearing shoes ready to go run. You know, they didn't deliver messages back then often with like a carriage or something. They would send a runner out and the runner would go and deliver the message and then come back with with a confirmation message. So having good shoes in that kind of profession was good. And so we have this idea that the the readiness of the gospel, of the good news of the gospel, is something when we hear the gospel, it makes us want to go tell others. It makes us want to get up and go. And that's really what Matthew 28 is, right? Is Jesus telling us, okay, we just completed the gospel, right? I've been here. I've done these things. You've seen the good news in the flesh right in front of you. Now go, and do these things, go make disciples, teach, baptize, and all these things. Yeah. And so the the receiving of the gospel, therefore, becomes an action where we go and deliver yeah. that message to others. And specifically, the gospel is the, the love of God given to us through Jesus Christ, his life for us, his death for us, his rising from the grave for us, mm-hmm. uh, so that our sins would be forgiven. And with that forgiveness of sins, we have life with God. Yep. And, and that's the good news that we have, that we celebrate, and that we share. Yep. And, um, and so there's, uh, Paul goes on then to talk about the helmet of salvation. Okay. And so what's the importance of a helmet? Uh, the helmet of salvation uh, is a confidence in what God has done. And so, and it's, it's 
I think I think it's a helmet here uh, because it's it's about understanding, and it's not about just like pure knowledge, but instead about wisdom and understanding. And so salvation is what comes to deliver us from our ultimate destiny and stake. So it's almost a philosophical kind of thing. Is it, it talks about our status before God. We're either people of salvation or not. And so if we're people of salvation, we've got that helmet of understanding that protects and defends us. If not, then we don't have it. We don't have that confidence. We don't yeah. have that sh- that certainty and that assuredness. And obviously a helmet would protect the head of a soldier and um, and their their mind. And so, mm-hmm. you know, God's word protects our mind um, against false thoughts. Um, there, are, there are so many false thoughts that are around us that uh, lies that can lead us away from God, whether it's uh, I'm not good enough or, you know, ways that we think about ourselves or the ways that we think about other people. Um, and that uh, the truth, again, of God's word protects our mind and guides us uh, into those God-pleasing actions. And um, uh, another image is the sword of the spirit. And so it's 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 interesting that all of the things that we've talked about so far are defensive. Mm-hmm. And this is the one thing that... Um, really the only thing that's offensive. We missed an important one. We missed the shield. Oh, I did. The shield of faith. We overlooked the shield of faith. And yeah. so to me, this is the one that ties in most aptly with what we've been talking about in terms of temptation so far today. Is Temptation is the, are those arrows of the evil one. That's yeah. his weapon. Is flaming, to try and flaming darts or flaming arrows of Satan. Yep. And so how do you contend with those? Well, it's like if you have all that other gear on so far, the salvation, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, and the sandals, it's like you can dodge a lot of arrows with that stuff and maybe deflect a few off your breastplate of righteousness and your helmet. But like eventually something's going to get through uh, and it's going to hurt you. And so what, what the, the shield of faith does is it's a coverall. Like when we talk about shields, Sometimes we think about like a little buckler on the arm that, you know, w- yeah. when we talk about shields in Jesus' time, we're talking about full body, these full body, like, like four, five foot tall by three foot wide shields that just covered the entire soldier up so that nothing could get through. And that's what faith is for us, is it's like if our trust and our confidence is God, there is no scheme of the devil, no uh, flaming arrow or dart that he can possibly impact us or affect us with. Now, if our if our faith comes down, you know, or we find mm-hmm. ourselves in moments of weakness, we become um, vulnerable. We become vulnerable. Yeah. But as long as we are placing our trust and our confidence, uh, he may still shoot those arrows at us and tempt us, but we will be able to overcome them. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, the the sword of the spirit. And right. then yeah, and then so you were mentioning everything so far purely mm-hmm. defensive, nothing to fight back with at all. You just become a kind of a mobile you know, armored platform that way, but you don't have the ability to actually challenge or confront the person who's trying to harm you until you introduce God's word. And then yeah. God's word becomes the sword, which allows you to strike back at the devil and shut down his his schemes. Yeah, and then how appropriate that uh, Paul ends this section uh, with an encouragement on prayer, mm-hmm. uh, to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Uh, and with this in mind, to be alert and always keep on praying, not only for ourselves, but for all the Lord's people. Yep. And, um, and so as we put on this armor of God, um, we're reminded that uh, God is there protecting us, watching over us, um, doing what's necessary to keep us safe. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so as uh, uh, just a kind of a final thought, a point to remember uh, from 1 Corinthians that no temptation has seized a person except what is common to mankind. And we're reminded that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Uh, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And that's, that's his promise for us today. Yeah. It's the only promise that gives us hope. Yeah, in my opinion. So and so, um, so this kind of brings us to the end of our our, our thoughts for today. Um, and before we close up, I guess I'm asking if we have any announcements. We've got a, another uh, work day on this coming Saturday between mm-hmm. nine and twelve. Um, 
Yeah. We have Backyard Bible Bash coming up on June 1st, which is just two weeks away today. So yeah. um, put that on your calendar. That's a, a fun way of getting together, um, having some fun. We'll do some barbecue, uh, do some Bible study, and play some music, and have some fun with some yeah. games. So and then uh, the Saturday after that is the men's retreat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it also reminds me that next next Wednesday I'm going to be gone. Okay. So we're going to take true. a break. Yeah, we'll take a break for a week and come back. Uh, should be the week after that to wrap yes. up the series on prayer, and mm-hmm. then we'll be back into Luke the following week after that. So three weeks yeah. from now. Yeah. So, so we want to thank you for being with us today and mm-hmm. and listening. And um, as we close, maybe we should close in a prayer. Yeah. All right. Good. If you'll bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and love. We thank you for the protection and uh, promises that you give us. Um, and as we think about the protection, we think about um, uh, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the, the helmet of salvation, and uh, our shoes fitted with the gospel message and the shield that protects us and uh, your word, the sword of the Spirit that uh, um, uh, we share uh, with this world. And we ask, Lord, that as we um, live out our life this day, help us to see where you are working around us so that we can join you in that work. Um, help us to be aware of the temptations that come our way or the temptations that uh, come around those that we love so that we might encourage them and uh, help them be fitted and ready for uh, the trials and the temptations that come our way. So we thank you for your word and your spirit that are active in our life, and we just simply ask that uh, uh, not only as you shield us, but also, again, remind us of the hope that we have so that we can share that hope with those around us as we share the heart of the King. We ask and pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great day in the Lord, and we'll see you next time.